Good morning, Shiplake. I hope we're all doing well this fine morning. Nice and cold out there. Right, I'm going to talk to you this morning um, about awe a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to share my, my screen with you. So I read uh, this article uh, a, few, a couple of years ago. It came up on New Scientist. I thought, oh, that looks very interesting and might be able to help me out with a few things. Um, and uh, it's kind of all about um, this emotion or um, that um, can do a huge amount of uh, impressive things like improve mood, improve your life satisfaction. It helps you with critical thinking. It kind of, it can um, um, make you think in, in different ways. Um, and it helps you feel more connected to the people around you and humanity itself. Um, so how do we how do we actually achieve this? How do we how do we feel feelings of awe? Well, it can happen in um, a number of different ways. I think we've probably all something that we've experienced. Um, whether it's just looking at something that has some beautiful scenery that's genuinely made you think, "Wow, that is actually amazing!" with, with real sincerity. Um, or it could just be a piece of skill on a, uh, on a on a football pitch or a rugby pitch, and you've seen someone do something amazing. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is hopefully um, going to in invoke a little bit, even a little bit of awe in you this morning. That's what I'm hoping for. That's my goal. Um, by talking about something that I find quite awe-inspiring, and that is um, my top five worlds of the solar system. Okay, so without further ado, number five. This is in reverse order. Number five. Venus. Venus is uh, often regarded as the uh, brightest star in the sky. This is actually not true. Um, no of hogwash, because it's not a star uh, and it's not the brightest. Sun and the moon are both brighter and it's a planet. Uh, it's a planet that's been extensively attempted to sort of uncover its mysteries. Obviously, when first discovered or shortly after, it would have been uh, noticed that there's this huge cloud around it and so not really not really knowing what's going on, on underneath the cloud. And so many, many missions, many, many missions were uh, attempted to go and uncover its secrets, uh, mostly by Russia to begin with. Lots of them failed. Um, uh, there was one program in particular, the Venera program, 16, 16 different probes attempted to go and land there. And they were, they were the ones that were most successful. Uh, and um, Venus is a pretty harsh place. Um, so those, those probes had to be built like tanks, and they were some of the heaviest things to have ever been, ever been the heaviest probes to have ever been launched. And they discovered uh, that Venus uh, is the hottest place uh, in, or well, the hottest planet in the, in the solar system, with average temperatures of around 480 degrees, and uh, which would melt lead, and pressures of 90 times that on Earth at, at, at sea level. Um, the clouds are largely carbon dioxide, but also sulfuric acid, um, such fun. Um, but it's that sort of those sulfuric acid clouds that make it so bright, they reflect a lot of the light. Um, and, um, but the reason it's so hot is because of all the CO2 traps in all of that heat and, and, uh, and it doesn't lose a lot. It then doesn't vary very much around, around the, uh, the planet, the temperature. It's pretty much consistently around that four, those high 400s. Um, so that's, that's Venus. It's kind of sometimes known as a, a sister Earth because it kind of could have been a bit like Earth, but that, that, that greenhouse effect just ran away and now it's, it's too hot really to sustain life, but a fascinating place nonetheless. Um, this is a picture uh, of the surface of Venus. It doesn't look necessarily like much, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's impressive to be able to have a photo of another planet. Um, from the surface, and one that you know would be pretty inhospitable uh, for, uh, for anyone standing on it. Um, none of the probes lasted more than about 90 minutes because they were just crushed and melted because it's such a horrible place. <laughs> right, number four. Number four is Saturn. Um, this is a photo from the Cassini probe, which flew um, over, over, over Saturn and orbited around it many, many times collecting all kinds of data um, uh, a few years ago. Uh, and uh, you'll notice here that it has a hexagonal North Pole, which is was very surprising. Scientists don't really 
know why it's hexagonal. It sort of assumes that most things uh, like hurricanes on Earth are sort of circular. If you're traveling to Saturn, it takes about three to six years in a space rocket. Or if you're traveling at the speed of a, uh, of a normal commercial plane, it would take about 1,500 years. So it's a long, long way away. It's a long way away. Um, bear in mind that going to Venus uh, in, a, in, a, in a rocket would only take about four or six months, or in a plane about five years. Um, Saturn has such a low density that if you could hypothetically have an ocean um, that you could put it in, it would float, uh, an, an Earth-like ocean. It would float because it's, so, it's so low density. Um, we've got a few more pretty epic photos. Um, this this uh, uh, encapsulates, I think, quite nicely how thin those rings are. They're only between about, a, they're only about a kilometer, they range, but they're only about a kilometer thin um, or thick. Uh, they also haven't been around for very long. They've only been around about 100 million years, which in astrological terms is not very long. And they've probably only got about um, 300 left to go as well. So we're actually very fortunate to be alive at the time when the rings are there for us to see. This one's a nice one. And this one's my favourite. Um, backlit, the sun behind Saturn. And what you can't see very well in that photo, but it is there, uh, is the Earth is actually included. There's a tiny little speck of probably only like one pixel on your screen to the bottom right. There it is blown up. There's the Earth, a little blue dot right in the corner. Um, kind of uh, encapsulates how small the Earth is compared to these things, these great distances. So number three, Jupiter. Jupiter is currently being uh, orbited by the Juno spacecraft, which is taking these fantastic photos. Um, it's so big uh, that it is, it is twice the mass of all the other planets combined. You add up all the other planets and then double it, you get, you get Jupiter, it's so big. Um, but to put that into context, the sun still makes up 99.8% of all of the mass of the whole solar system. So whilst Jupiter's by far the biggest planet, the sun dwarfs everything else. 99.8% of the whole solar system, um, just, to, just as a little tangent. Um, the exciting thing about, about Jupiter that's sort of recently been um, theorized and, and, and on the brink of sort of definitely being confirmed is the theory that underneath its surface, it has this liquid hydrogen ocean because the pressures are so great, it makes hydrogen behave very strangely. Um, and it turns into this bizarre kind of liquid form with temperatures of up to 50,000 degrees centigrade. Now to put that into context, the center of the Earth is around 6,000 degrees centigrade, uh, which obviously is a lot hotter than the surface at about 19 degrees. And to put that into context, the surface of the sun is about the same. It's, well, it's about five and a half, 6,000 degrees. But the middle of the sun is about 15 million. Um, so these massive temperature differences between the surface in the center of different bodies is interesting, I think. Here's a grumpy Jupiter. Jupiter was also th is also thought to have um, moved around its orbit in its early formation, and it may have uh, come into even as close to the sun as the orbit of Mars. And it's thought that it might have cleared some of the past for some of the, the debris in the formation of Mars, which is why Mars is much smaller uh, than Earth and Venus. Right, number two. Number two is possibly one you won't recognize from this photo. This was the best photo we had of um, Saturn's moon, Titan, uh, until Cassini um, went and orbited Saturn. Um, and part of its mission of orbiting Saturn was to also explore a few of its moons, Titan included. Okay. Um, this is a photo of the surface of Titan, and this got astronomers um, and planetary scientists incredibly excited for the one reason that the rocks you can see there are rounded. The reason, the, and uh, they weren't, they were hoping, they were hoping to see rounded rocks. They were actually hoping to see something even more amazing, which they haven't seen in this photo. Um, they were hoping to see lakes of, they were, because uh, as you can see from that first photo, uh, Titan is covered in clouds. 
they were hoping that there might be some form of um, lakes, some form of liquid in, in some in some form. Um, and unfortunately, this photo doesn't show, but it does hint that there might be because rounded rocks means that there's some kind of erosion going on. Um, and erosion means some form of flowing liquid. Um, and then this photo, or this composite of photos, was taken by Cassini from orbit. Um, and we can see there light shimmering off lakes, the lakes of Titan. Now, these lakes are not liquid water, like the ones on Earth. Uh, they are, in fact, liquid methane, a liquid methane, because it's so cold there. Methane is, is a liquid, not a gas. Um, but all the clouds are largely um, methane clouds, and it does rain. And there are rivers of liquid methane. And this is the only other place other than Earth where there is rain and conceivably a rainbow. Um, so I think Titan's uh, an absolutely fascinating place to have such sort of similar sort of weather to Earth um, and uh, have those similar sorts of processes. Um, so it was, it was the Hudgens probe named after the astronomer in 1655 um, that discovered Titan. And the probe Hudgens went to, went to actually land on the surface. Right, now I've slightly cheated. I struggled to, really struggled to actually get my top five and to, to ignore everything else because there's so many fantastic worlds out there. Um, so I've got quite a lot of honorable mentions, but I will run through them fairly quickly. Um, so, honourable mentions. First up, we have Mercury. Most interesting thing, thing about Mercury is that it, has, it is the most extreme place um, in terms of temperature, uh, in terms of surface temperature in the solar system. Because it uh, doesn't have an atmosphere, it can't trap any of its heat. So, on the night side, it loses it and it goes down to about minus 180. But on the day side, when it's facing the sun and it's so close, up to about 420 degrees. So it masses extremes in temperature. Um, it's not that it's not visited very much because it's really hard to get to because it's quite hard to get yourself into orbit or even to fly by without accidentally crashing into the sun because uh, it's so close and the sun is so massive. Right then we have this one. This is Mimas, um, uh, most notable for that giant crater on the side of it. It's actually a very very small moon. Um, and it's not been active for a very, very long time in terms of geologically active, probably since it was formed. You can tell that because of there are so many craters on it, not just that big, massive one. Um, but so many other smaller ones means that it's, uh, it's not been active for a very long time. It means that all those asteroids that have been hitting it over millions and billions of years, then it's just stayed like that. Um, but yeah, it's sometimes known as the Death Star Moon because it does look a bit like a Death Star. Um, one of um, one of Saturn's moons. Then we have Europa. Europa is quite large. Um, I've got a slide later about different sizes of moons. Um, quite large is one of Jupiter's moons. It's the second one out from from Jupiter, covered in very very thick ice. The ice is about fifteen to twenty five kilometers thick. Um, but very excitingly. Underneath that ice, it's thought that there's a subsurface ocean of liquid water. Now, wherever we find liquid water on Earth, we find life. So that's a very exciting prospect to go and explore. But getting through that ice to go and find out what's there, not an easy. Um, then we get to Io. Io is the most, that's, so that's, the, that's one of Jupiter's moons. It's uh, the first, the closest to Jupiter, so the first moon. And it's the most volcanic place in the solar system with lava plumes of up to 250 miles high. Um, and it's, that, it's, it's so volcanic because of the stretching, the tidal stretching um, that it undergoes being so close to, to such a massive planet Jupiter, but also being tugged by big moons. Its other side means that the whole planet just gets squeezed and stretched and it heats the inside and it makes it so volcanic. Right. Onto Enceladus. Enceladus is a little bit like Europa, but in miniature, one of um, one of Saturn's moons. Um, so again, the ice the, uh, the ice that surrounds it is about eighteen to twenty two kilometers thick, but at the South Pole, much much thinner. Looking at this, 
we can see that there are in fact geysers or geyser-like, um, sometimes called cryovolcanoes, but geysers really. Uh, but they they spew out fro they well they spew out water and other and other compounds. Uh, but it, of course, instantly freezes. So so you get these sort of ice sheets. Now the the ice some of that ice then falls back onto Enceladus, but some of it actually contributes to the ring system um, of Saturn because it's it's within one of its rings, and it, some of the ice actually just starts to orbit orbit Saturn as part of the rings. Um, and again, um, when um, when Cassini shot this, um, scientists were like, "Oh, we really want to get get to that south pole of Enceladus and see what's." And see what's underneath the ice because again wherever we find water on earth we find life so these two planets who are open and cellulose are the best bets um, for possible even if it's microbial life on um, uh, on another planet right then we have pluto this was the best photo of pluto we had until the new horizon spacecraft took this one uh, and everyone was very surprised that, there, that this wasn't as pockmarked as mimas was earlier with craters because it was thought that Pluto was completely um, sort of barren and hadn't changed at all. But with these smooth surfaces, you can see that actually it must be changing more, more frequently. Otherwise it would be full of craters like, like Mimas and, and like our moon, um, which hasn't been active for a long, a long time. But with that big smooth white patch in the middle, that must be quite a recent thing and quite how the, the systems work on there to allow for that, scientists don't really know. This is a good little um, descriptor of the different sizes of moons. You can see tiny Enceladus um, down there on the bottom row, uh, all the way up to big old Titan in the top row. Uh, Mercury is about the same size as Callisto, uh, and Pluto is about the same size as Triton, just to give it, just to give some perspective. Right, number one, the much anticipated number one. This is gonna feel like a bit of a cheat, but of course it can only be, oh, not that, Earth. It can only be Earth because, let's face it, Earth is our home. Earth is the only place we know in the entire universe that has life. And of course, Earth was, Earth was created out of um, dust that came together, rock that came together, water that came together to eventually produce life just out of the natural processes of the universe. So life and complex life like ourselves um, are really the universe actually thinking about itself, which I think is an amazing thing. Um, and why Earth is has got to be the number one planet in the solar system, because it's the only place we know that has life. And of course, you can still find plenty of places on Earth to get that awe-inspiring uh, feeling when we look at those fantastic landscapes of a completely dynamic uh, planet. Um, but I'm going to finish on this photo of Earth which was taken by the Voyager probes, the furthest, the currently furthest probes from Earth. Although they were taken, this is taken about a million kilometers away, I think, um, maybe even further by, as I say, one of the Voyager probes. Um, and I'm gonna finish with a quote from Carl Sagan, um, who was sort of in charge of the program, uh, certainly the media side of it. Just a short, a short little paragraph. He said, to my mind, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thanks very much, guys, for listening to me, and I hope you get to go one on time. <laughs>